Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. No. Um. <laughs>
she uh, proceeded to share with me these really unsettling stories about her interactions with a white van. Um, and that just opened up a world of interest for me. Um, as a latchkey kid myself, I often rode my bike home from school or walked home from school. And, you know, there was always, um, there was never like a sense of, oh, I'm in danger. Uh, and I never felt that growing up in a small town, but there was, um, you know, one instance where I did notice a van sort of kind of parked ominously on a corner as I was walking by. And then as I moved forward three or four blocks, I noticed the van there again. And I just remember feeling like, you know what? I don't know what's going on here, but it doesn't feel right. And I feel like I need to take a shortcut through some people's yards to get back to my house. And now I never saw that van again, um, but it certainly connected to the story that was shared with me that day. And I just thought it's such a unique perspective because, you know, most serial killer stories are told, you know, with uh, from the perspective of like an investigative reporter or a detective who's trying to solve the mystery of these crimes. And in our story, there is no investigative reporter. There is no detective because the sad thing about this was that this killer was operating at a time where nobody was looking for these girls. Nobody knew what was happening um, until it was way too late. Um, and so for our protagonist, Annie, you know, she lives in a world where she's completely um, unaware of, you know, the danger that really is to fall upon her. And this also is a tie-in, indirectly at least, with the with what's going on now with the human trafficking scandals that have finally been coming to light. Yeah, I mean that's that's really unfortunate as well. Just the um, the the magnitude of of what is happening, just in general, of you know how how what, you know how large a scale that that human beings are even trafficked in this world um, is um, just very sad and. Um, and, you know, as part of our work in terms of missing children and such and wanting the film to be able to work on, you know, another level where we could kind of give back something out of this. Uh, the producers partnered up with NICMEC, um, the uh, National uh, Association of Children Missing uh, Children, um, to be able to benefit a portion of the proceeds ultimately from the sales of the film uh, to benefit their work. Uh, as they, you know, constantly are trying to um, locate missing children and um, and help, uh, you know, solve cold cases. That's an even greater bonus in wanting to see the film. Yeah, no, it's it's something that we all sort of felt passionate about of finding an organization that we could we could partner with, uh, and that certainly was one that we uh, we identified pretty pretty early on. And uh, actress Ali Larder actually, um, who's an executive producer on the project and star. Uh, kind of in, made that introduction uh, to us. You know, I, if this wasn't such a serious topic, I would joke that, you know, it's easy to be the star if you're the executive producer. But, you know, she has her heart in the film, so that makes it even more more exciting. Uh, but you also got uh, Breck Basinger. You got mm -hmm. Sean Astin. You have such a great cast in all of this. When you were putting the film together and realizing the star power that was coming along with it, you know, what was that like during the casting process and how quick were some of these people ready to say yes? So when we were casting, we really wanted to start with um, our Annie and find the best actress for that role. So we we kind of went through, a, you know, a, a pretty hefty process to finally find uh, Madison. And when... Um, when she read and, you know, we had a subsequent Zoom call, I just found, um, I just thought she was going to be really great for the role. And when we actually got to work, she was just um, such a dream. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of directors probably talk about their actors and these really glowing, you know, flowery memes. But um, truly, she's just so easy to work with that it, it rarely felt like we were working we were just sort of playing and coming up with new ideas and uh she's just very expressive um uh leaves her ego at the door and is just like let's get to work let's make this great let you know what do we need to do to to tell the best story we can um and uh you know sean and ali 
uh, when they came on board, they were um, just, you know, adamant professionals and such um, advocates for the film and, and the, the story itself. You know, um, Allie was, um, I think it was, it was sort of a tough time actually for Allie because she was, um, I think, leaving her children for the first time for work in, in a little bit of while because of COVID. Um, we were just coming out of like the COVID sanctions and everything and able to film again when we were, when we went into production. So she became like the mom on set and, went, and uh, was such a, you know, she was literally the mom on set and then, um, you know, just had that nurturing um, uh, quality to her with, um, you know, both the girls who played her daughters, but Breck and, and Madison and um, was just so, you know, exploratory with the material and really just wanted to, you know, once again, just wanted to, you know, put together the best performance that made the most sense for the film. And I really appreciated that from her. And uh, Sean himself was uh, a really good mentor for me as a, a first time scripted feature filmmaker. Um, so we had a lot of really good, you know, <laughs> pointers, if you will, uh, you know, when we were sort of in a, in a bind uh, or just needed like a pick me up on a day or something was, um, was just really, really helpful to the whole process. And, you know, the, I think that it was a, at its core, it really is a, a family film. This is a, a, a sort of a, um, a horrible circumstances that happened to this particular family and one of their daughters. And uh, that family vibe, um, I got, I brought them all in, you know, a week and a half early so that they could sort of begin that process of bonding and, and finding those connections with each other. And um, as a result, I feel like we all sort of became a family in the process and, um, and hopefully that, you know, comes through on the, on, in the film itself. Are we looking at this being uh, not rated or a PG-13 rating so people can bring their families in and have these discussions with them? That's a really great question. And I don't even know if I am the one to answer that. Um, I mean, I, the film itself is much more theater of the mind, if you will, then it's definitely not a slasher. It's not gory, um, but it's, um, you know, it's really set up in suspense and, you know, uh, the payoff in a, in a really thrilling climax. Because that's something, you know, with, with a topic that this heavy, sometimes they get an R rating because of how heavy the subject matter is, even if there isn't any cursing or, mm -hmm. you know, or it being a slasher film, like you said, this is more theater of the mind. But, you know, we do want that younger audience to also pay attention to this because this is what affects them directly. It is, you know, ultimately, I really hope that we don't get an R rating. I, I hope it ends up being in a, a PG-13 sort of mindset uh, because, you know, it feels like with the two leads of the the story, the sisters, um, Annie and Margaret and what they go through, it really feels like it will, will it should connect with a, a teen girl audience, honestly. And, and um, I think that's sort of what we were hoping it would kind of, I maybe mean, both teen girl and teen male, but... Um, that's sort of, I think, where the film sits in a really kind of fun way. Uh, and then, of course, anybody who loves true crime will also, you know, immediately fall into that category as well. You know, when writing something like this and then directing it, being a father of two children, uh, what's that like for you on an emotional level, not only being a dad, you know, separating the dad from the director? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, there's definitely a, there's like the filmmaker filter, right? And then there's the father filter coming in from that perspective. And one of the, you know, one of the difficult things for both Ali and Sean and myself, because we're all parents and we all have, you know, Sean has older children. Ali, Ali's children are a little bit younger than mine, um, kind of the same age, but you know, and you know, we were all looking at this and having a little bit of a hard time as contemporary parents who are so aware of media. And so, um, you know, whether it's social media or the local news, sensationalized news, there isn't anything that slightly happens that isn't completely blown out of proportion. Um, so, you know, we come from like, you know, our our radars are so, you know, up and ready to like find, you know, to, to hunt down what is a possible danger for a child where um, compared to a, the parents of the 70s, where there they had no radar like that whatsoever. There was it was you know they're shipping us out in the um, in the early morning and you know 
So waiting for us to come home at night for dinner and, you know, we're drinking water out of a hose pipe at a school or someone's house or, you know, wandering through forests, having fun with our friends, uh, riding bikes, going places our parents never know we even went to, right? So it was a completely different time. And I think for the three of us, we sort of had to like readjust our sense of a radar um, so that we could really sort of um, play, get the right mindset of these particular parents um, who were, you know, skeptical of what was happening to their daughter and really couldn't see it uh, because it really wasn't happening to them directly. Warren, I wish we had more time because I would have loved to have gotten into now social media being the white van uh, mm -hmm. in that same regard. But will you be at Newport Beach Film Festival promoting the film? I will actually be there. Uh, we're having our world premiere on October 14th at 7.30, I believe the Triangle 3 Theater. And I will be there for a Q&A afterward. Really looking forward to sharing this film with an audience for the first time and being able to have a conversation afterward. Um, you know, the only thing I'll lead with here, or end with, I should say, is this is actually an open cold case that uh, detectives are still working on after 43 years. And just last year, they were able to identify one of the two remaining Jane Doe bodies buried on the property. So this is a very active and live um, story um, that's unfolding in real time as we sort of have ours kind of in a locked time period um, within the film itself. My God, man, that's heart wrenching. Real quick, let us know where we can find you, the film on social media and the organization that you guys are working with so we can donate to them as well in searching for these missing children. Sure. Give me, uh, I don't know if you're going to edit this. I'm going to, I don't want to get it wrong. Exactly. I think I'm, um, the, so I can be found at just at Warren skills, uh, like on Instagram, um, white van movie at white van movie, also on Instagram and the organization that Legion M and Garrison film, uh, and skills films have partnered with is Nick Mech, which is the national center for missing and exploited children. Warren, thank you so much for your time. I will see you this week in Newport Beach. Congratulations on such a powerful film. And I can't wait to hang out with you in person, you know, and have a couple of drinks at the after party. Yeah, let's do it. That'd be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.